I think that's my cue. Good morning. It's good to have all of you. I think that's my second cue, actually, now that I think about it and replay the last couple of minutes in my mind. Uh, there we go. James, was, we were waiting on James. It wasn't me. We were waiting on James. We are keep waiting. Good morning. Talk amongst yourselves for another few seconds. There you go. Sorry, I think I put that there backwards. It's my fault. Yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to our service this morning. It's good to have each of you here today. Uh, we do have a few announcements uh, before we uh, get to the reason that we came. We didn't come for announcements. I know that. We came in order to worship together as God's people, and we will certainly be doing that this morning. I do want to let you know of some opportunities to serve and some things that are coming up in our church family. Uh, Wednesday night discipleship is, of course, still ongoing. We have our Wednesday night group that meets together at 7 o'clock back in the fellowship hall. Uh, there is a Zoom component, a Zoom element to that as well. If you are not yet getting out amongst other people, uh, you can certainly join us by Zoom, and I encourage you to look for that invitation in your inbox. If you're not getting it or you haven't received it in a while and you want to join by Zoom, please talk to this gentleman right over here holding the base after the service today, and he will make sure that he gets your name and number and, and gets you involved with that particular element. Uh, General Conference is coming up. That is our essentially, how do you describe General Conference to someone who's never been to General Conference? Family reunion, uh, revival service, business meeting, yeah, unfortunately there are those things, that, but that's part of making sure that everything gets done that needs to get done and, and gets done openly and, and in a way that's, that's right as well. So anyway, that's all part of General Conference, and that's coming up at uh, the end of April 429, April 29th through May the 1st. That'll be up in our Colleyville Church and be hosted by them this year. Uh, camp volunteers. We still, last week was the last week to sign up for a camp volunteer? Yes. Yes. So, <clears throat> awkwardly talk here. The next thing to be looking for is to sign up for the youth to attend camp. So um, that's not up yet. We're still establishing numbers and all of that. Okay. But anyway, don't forget about camp. That sign up is coming and that's really important. So start talking to people so when it's time to sign up, you know who to get over there. Right. Okay. And before you leave the awkward microphone, <laughs> um, camp is... This, uh, June 6th through 12th. June 6th through 12th at Sandy Creek Bible Camp. That hasn't changed. No. Okay, good. It hadn't changed no. in 20 years. I don't know why it would change this year. But anyway, Sandy Creek Bible Camp, uh, which is down outside of Brenham, uh, kind of a, uh, down, in the, down along the creek, and it is beautiful under the trees. Lots of heat and humidity and mosquitoes, and it's camp in Texas, and you just have to love it. Uh, uh, pray, for, uh, pray for camp. It's not too early to start praying for camp as that... Uh, as things start to, get, uh, start to gear up for that, uh, for the kids who will be there, for the workers who are involved in it, uh, for the leaders who have been planning for a year to, uh, in order to get back to camp uh, this particular June. So there you go. All of that's coming up. And if you have any more questions or anything, you can talk to me or talk to Cameron uh, after the service this morning. Uh, as uh, we have been doing for the last several months, our offering will be received in the basket at the back there by the doors. Uh, we are hoping to be able to get back to offering plates at some point, but for right now, we're still in the basket. So there you go. Thank you so much for your continued support for our local church and all of the ministries and, and uh, missions that are supported through your giving. Thank you so much for your continued faithfulness to God in, uh, in all that you do. Uh, one last thing, if you have any kind of... Uh, if, if you need to go back and look at any of the previous uh, services, if you missed something, if you are... Uh, traveling in a couple of weeks and you want to uh, be able to to keep up on what's happening remember bethelmethodist.com slash robinson and you can always find our services posted there uh, any other announcements anything else we need to know about as we begin our service this morning here are these words from the book of acts so when peter saw it he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Before we sing our first song together this morning, I invite you, bow your heads. Let's pray. Father God, we are gathered here this morning in this place. We have heard the songs already. We have read the scriptures that remind us that you are the one at work among us, that you are the one who heals, who convicts, who redeems. In you, Lord God, is the power to bring about refreshing for our souls, to bring new life where there was only death. Father, this morning, we testify to the fact that we stand as a needy people in constant need of of your presence in our lives and of your grace that you extend to us. And so this morning, in this service, Father, we ask that you will remind us of all of these things. Help us, Lord God, to recognize the need that we have for you. And help us, Lord God, through the power of your Holy Spirit to respond to you and to receive from you that which you so freely offer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together this morning. To stand together as we sing Springs of Living Water. We can get into this one. It's a great camp song. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame. Beside me, there I found the blessed care of Christ. With me, I came where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I to satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, a wonderful and bountiful supply. Water from the hills of God, it makes me glad and happy all the way. Now, gently, grace and blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul to satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water. Wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior can invite you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul to satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Amen. You can be seated. Psalm 4. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood, Selah? But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still, Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both 
Lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's, let's, stand, uh, let's sing the next hymn, hymn number 625, Son of My Soul. Let's stand together as we sing. Son of my soul, our Savior dear, it is not night if thou be near. Oh, may no earthbound cloud arise to hide thee from thy servant's eyes when the soft dews of kindly sleep my weary eyelids gently steep be my last thought how sweet to rest forever on my savior's breast abide with me from morn till eve for without thee Abide with me when night is nigh, for without thee I dare not die. Be near to me, bless me when I wake, ere through the world my way I take. Abide with me till in thy love I lose myself. In heaven above. Let's remain standing as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen You can be seated Sam, I'd like to point out to you that according to the clock on the back wall, I am one minute ahead of schedule this morning. <laughs> yeah, we sang the song faster. That's what it was. That's what it was. Oh, my. I love teasing Sam. I don't know why. As we uh, pray this morning, we have uh, pray for our needs within our local body. We have, of course, uh, at the top on, on First and foremost in my mind this morning is, uh, is Sue Haug. Just a moment. I wanted to share with you uh, a text I received this morning from her daughter, Ginger. Um, I asked uh, how Sue was doing this morning, and she said, so far she seems to be having a good day. Uh, Sue has been placed under the care of hospice. Uh, they took Sue from the hospital out back to uh, the family home and uh, set everything up yesterday for, uh, for the hospice care. Um, Ginger says, I think mom is doing much better than she was. Thank you for checking. Um, please come by the house anytime. So um, continue to pray for, for Sue as she reaches this point in her illness. Um, The, I'm sorry, give me a second. The opportunity to minister to 
and to pray for a sister in Christ who has reached this point. Uh, she, in this long struggle against cancer, against the issues that she's faced over the last couple of years, Sue, whenever you ask her, how are you? How are things going? You know what her response is. Oh, I'm fine. How so-and-so? How's Sherlyn doing? How's Martin? We know this. Anyone who's had the opportunity to talk to Sue recently knows that she still has that, that outlook. This morning as we pray for Sue, as we pray for her family, we do so with the understanding that God is able to work in a situation like this and still brings glory to himself. We are reminded of the strength that God gives to Sue, even at this point, not to look in at herself and to be completely self-absorbed, but instead to still look outward. That's a gift from God at any point in our lives, but especially at this point in Sue's life. Remember her. Remember her family this week. Pray for them. Continue to lift up the other needs that we have. I know that a list of those has been going by on the on the board behind me before service, that there are those things that we pray for every week. We continue to pray for our missionary families. We continue to pray for the ministry of, uh, of uh, the Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry that we're involved in. And I think John told me there were over 200 families that were served again yesterday and 11 brand new clients uh, who, who visited the food pantry for the first time. And that ministry continues to be such an important ministry that, that we support uh, through our, our gifts and also through opportunities that we have to go and to, and to be there in person. God opens many doors, doors all around us, in an effort to, to step through those doors, in an effort to minister to the needs of those who are around us. Sometimes that's simply sitting at the bedside of someone and holding our hand and reminding her of what a blessing she's been. And what a blessing she still is. And sometimes that's actually going and hauling boxes of food and putting them in people's cars. And sometimes, sometimes it's just simply extending love and grace to someone that we don't even know. But all of those are God-given opportunities to serve. And this morning we thank him for each of those opportunities. And we pray that God will give us wisdom to step through those doors and to follow his voice and to be his people. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we come to you, we thank you for all of the ways that you are able to work among us. Father, we recognize the need that Sue's family has right now, and we ask that you will, that you will be with her, that you will be with, with her sister, that you will be with her kids, and you will be with her grandkids. We pray, Father, that you will help Sue in every way possible over the next few days and weeks just simply to recognize your presence with her and to be reminded again that you, Lord God, are the welcoming Father. You, Lord God, are the one who extends his grace and love to each of us. And we thank you, Father, for all of the ways that you give us those opportunities to serve you by serving others. We thank you, Father, for for the ways that you continue to be present in the lives of so many in our congregation, whether they're here in person or whether they're, they're online this morning. We ask, Father, that you will continue to be with those who are going through great times of trial and, and suffering. Continue to be with those who are going through times of, of, uh, of treatment for Choice and Joan, for Max and Sally, for Donna and, uh, and Sherlyn. These are, these are folks who immediately spring to my mind this morning. But I know that there are others. I know that there are. And I ask, Father, that you will draw near to each of these this morning who, who is suffering in some way. Perhaps it's the the sting of grief that's still there. Perhaps, Lord God, it's it's the thought of being alone, the emptiness that we can sometimes feel when we are separated from others that we love. Whatever it is, Father, this morning, we ask that you will meet that need 
and come in the way that only you can and minister to us and remind us, Lord God, that in Christ is all that we need. Draw us close to you today, Lord God. Fill us with your presence that we might be a reflection of you to the world around us. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning from the New Testament comes from uh, 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as Christ is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. Let's sing together. Stand together, we'll sing hymn number 314, What Wondrous Love Is This. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, that calls the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, God laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid across his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb, who is the great I Am. While millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. While millions join the theme, I will sing. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be. And through eternity, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And through eternity, I'll sing on. And you can be seated. Today we go back to a series of sermons that we were preaching in earlier this year, the David and Jesus series. Yes, for those of you who were here and who were paying attention to that, that was our Lent 
series this past year. I, yes, it's not Lent anymore. I do recognize that. I do realize that. Uh, but there was just this one more David story that just kept at me, and I kept thinking, this one needs to be told. We need to hear this story again this morning. And who knows, God might have another David story in store for us before the year's over. Who knows? But for this morning, we are looking at a story that is a little bit different from the rest of the ones that we've seen. Uh, the stories that we've looked at so far throughout this, uh, throughout this series, uh, we saw David being poet, we saw David being warrior, being shepherd, and then finally we saw David as failed king, and we saw all of the ways in which David then compared to Jesus. Remember, it was, um, it was Jesus who was that fulfillment of the promise that God made to David, that he would set, God would set a descendant of David, a son of David, up on the throne to rule and to reign forever. So a lot of folks look at Solomon and think, oh, well, that's the fulfillment of that promise. And it was, in a way, temporarily, but in the grand scheme of things, in a much bigger way, Jesus is that fulfillment. And so thus, we have that comparison, if you will, between David and Jesus. And we come back to that again this morning. You'll see how this works out. The story that we have before us this morning is a story about David recognizing the fact that God is showing grace and love to David. There's something interesting that, that happens in us when we recognize that God is demonstrating his grace and showing his love to us. We become, if you will, a conduit. We become a means then of allowing God's love and God's grace to be shared with those around us. That is the natural response of a life that recognizes God's love and God's grace at work. There is a tendency sometimes by, by some folks who, who think, oh, well, this is just, you know, I'm, I'm just getting lucky in my life, and all of these things that are happening to me are, are, are happening because of something that I've done. Or even on the other side of that, on the other end of that scale, oh, this is, you know, where is God in the midst of everything that I'm going through? Where is God in the midst of my grief and my pain and, and my sickness and, and my worry and my confusion? Where is God in the midst of this? The, the fact is God is there in the midst of all of it. And even through those times of darkness and pain, God is still extending his grace and his love. And when we recognize that God is there, that he is extending those things, we stop being that, that reservoir that's focused only on itself, and we become then that pipeline through which God's love flows to the world around us. We realize it's not all about us, and I don't have to be happy and feel good and, and have everything that I want all the time. It's all about God being glorified through this process. That's where we find David this morning in our story, remembering that it is God who has been at work in this entire process of bringing David to this point and setting David up on the throne as the successor to Saul. We have to remember, as we read this story, about God's design for the office of, of king. It was meant to be a position of servant leadership that demonstrated who really was in charge over Israel. That it wasn't David, it hadn't been Saul, it wouldn't be Solomon but that it was God, and God was the one who was at work in this situation, setting things in the right path, establishing boundaries for that path so that the nation would continue to go in God's way and to be God's people to the world so that the entire world could come to know who God was and how it was that God was at work redeeming and restoring and making himself known to the world. We have in our passage this morning all of these concepts of grace and love. And the thing that I really like about it is that here is this beautiful Old Testament passage that talks about these New Testament ideas. Let's stop talking about the passage and read it, shall we? Second Samuel, starting in verse, 2 Samuel 9, starting in verse 1. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul? 
that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And so when they called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness, to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and he prostrated himself. That means he, he laid down, just simply flat on the ground. And he said, and, and, no, he didn't say anything. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here is your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And then he bowed himself and he said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given you your master's son. I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him. You shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. There is a word in the Hebrew language, Hesed. It's often translated by the English words of steadfast love, mercy, kindness, or grace. The, the problem with translating this word, the reason that there's so many alternative words to translate this one Hebrew word, is because this is a very complex word. It deals with a very complex topic. And the topic that it deals with is how we understand God's character and God's actions with humanity. I came across a paper written by Will Kynes uh, back in 2010. It was in the publication entitled Knowing and Doing, and it's uh, the newsletter of the C.S. Lewis Institute. First of all, I have to say I had no idea that there was such a newsletter, and I'm embarrassed it's taken me this long to find out that the C.S. Lewis Institute has a newsletter. But there you go, Knowing and Doing. Will Kynes wrote the following in reference to how to define this word hesed. While hesed usually is used to describe God's activity with humanity, the word can be used to demonstrate a relationship between people. When hesed is used in the horizontal, that's between people, relationship, there is always the idea of concrete, practical action, usually an action of restoration. Think of Pharaoh's cupbearer who was restored to his position or of the Israelite army protecting Rahab and her family from destruction when the walls of Jericho fell. Never is hesed an abstract feeling. Even though Kynes didn't refer to this story that we're looking at today uh, from David's life, God's hesed is revealed in David's actions toward Mephibosheth. The gracious love that David shows to Mephibosheth doesn't come from out of the blue. David, we are told, is looking for someone in Saul's family to whom kindness, that's the word hesed there, to whom kindness could be shown. To understand why God, or why David is seeking to show hesed to the family of the man who tried to kill him, we need to remember an event that occurred much earlier in David's life. So, for just a moment, let's think back into David's story, all the way back to 1 Samuel 18. We were told that Jonathan and David made a promise to each other, that these two best friends made a promise to each other and said, essentially, no matter what happens in the future, if, if, if Saul remains king, Jonathan said, I will make sure that your family is protected. And David said, if 
God allows me to become king. You know, I've been the anointed. I, I've been anointed uh, by the prophet. Uh, I, I know that the time of Saul and Saul's family is supposed to come to an end. If if God allows me to become king, then I promise Jonathan that I will make sure that your family is taken care of. This is unheard of in this part of the world, in any part of the world. Whenever a new king comes to the throne, the way to handle things is to go through and to wipe out everybody, every trace of the previous king's family so that there's not some kind of rebellion in the future so that there's not some kind of uprising where the old family shows up and says well we have a a claim to this throne let's start a war and see who wins David would have been well within his cultural rights to hunt down and to exterminate every last member of Saul's family but God has a much bigger agenda than allowing David to, at this point, to fulfill this idea of making sure that all of the cultural retribution things are taken care of. David now recognizes that God has put David in this place of leadership. There's a time of peace that's going through Israel. Yes, there's a time of mourning as well for for David because Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle, but now as David sits there on the throne he seems to have this time of remembering remembering Jonathan remembering his best friend remembering all the things that had happened to bring David to this point and recognizing that it's God at work here and David is moved by God to extend this kindness to a descendant of Jonathan and the person is found the person who is found is Mephibosheth Jonathan's son Mephibosheth is probably a name you're not familiar with There won't be, I said last week there would be a test on Wednesday night, there will not be a test on how to pronounce Mephibosheth on Wednesday night at Discipleship Study. But you can practice still, if you want to impress Sam on Wednesday night as he leads Discipleship Study, you can practice and impress him. Mephibosheth. No. No. I spelled it one time and then copied and pasted it over and over and over and over (laughs) when I was preparing my notes. (sighs) It stands to reason that we should be more familiar with Mephibosheth, with the son of Jonathan, because he shows up three times in the David story. The first time is right after the death of Saul and Jonathan. We're told the story of how Mephibosheth, as a young man, was injured. After Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle, the royal family flees from the palace. Um, There's the very real possibility that the Philistines are coming to the palace in order to wipe out the rest of uh, of the Israelite kings so that the Philistines can establish themselves as the rulers over over this part of the world. There's also the imagined fear that the family has that David and his band of followers may take this opportunity following Saul and Jonathan's death to kind of step in and, like I said, fulfill that cultural vendetta kind of mentality that they might come in and, and retaliate for Saul's relentless pursuit of David. Regardless of the reason that this family was in fear, they're running in panic. And in that panic, Jonathan's young son, who we're told is just four or five years old, is dropped. His ankles are broken, and this injury doesn't heal properly, and the young boy grows up crippled. It's easy to imagine. It's easy for us to think about and to imagine in this story that there's more than an injury to his ankles that cripples this young man, Mephibosheth. After all, there are many people today who have problems in their bodies, but they have a very healthy outlook on life. Worse than the injuries that this young man suffered to his body, it's possible that the people around Mephibosheth crippled his spirit as well. There had to have been a sense in which he grew up hearing people talk about things like, it should have been you up there on that throne, or David has stolen what should rightfully belong to you. Or, here we are, suffering away in Lodabar, when we should be up there in Jerusalem, enjoying the life in the palace. Now, understand, we don't have any firm scriptural evidence that says that this actually went on. But we can imagine, based upon how things have happened in our own lives, or what we've heard about in the lives of other people, we can imagine that words like this would have been spoken around this young man. And after a while... After a while, our lives start to reflect what the people around us are saying to us. 
when David's men showed up in Lodabar, there could be only one conclusion. Even though they had tried to hide Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth has been found out. And now David was going to put this young man to death in a very public way to let everyone know that David had all the power and that there would never be an uprising from the previous king's family. After all, that's what Saul would have done. And so it's probably the way that this new guy is going to handle threats as well. And so we see Mephibosheth there laying flat on his face in front of David just by his very posture, begging, begging for mercy for himself, for his family, for his young son. And instead of receiving that death sentence, instead of being publicly executed, instead of the rest of the family being put down the way that they expected it would happen, the unbelievable grace of God steps into the picture. David speaks Mephibosheth's name. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. To be at that point of standing before the one who is there as your judge, and instead of hearing a pronouncement of death, you hear your name spoken. Hmm. What Mephibosheth found was not murder, but loving action and kindness. In a word, hesed. David calls Mephibosheth by name. David restores to Mephibosheth all that had been lost to him. David gives to Mephibosheth a place of honor at the royal table. And Mephibosheth recognizes that all of this grace and love is nothing that he deserves on his own. Nothing that he has earned because of who he is. I am a dead dog, he says. I deserve nothing. God's loving kindness and his gracious action still has tremendous power to transform our life when we turn to him. If we listen, we can hear God call us by our name this morning. And when we listen, we realize God knows us better than we know ourselves. God demonstrates his love to us by forgiving our sins, by cleansing us from sin, by providing his daily grace to keep us from sinning. That's what John was writing about in his, in his first letter there. It's all of those things. God invites us into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. God's love and kindness is not given because we deserved it or because we have earned it in any way. God's love is given because God seeks to restore all of humanity to himself. Hesed is a kind of love that can truly change a person for the better. And there's one more time that Mephibosheth shows up in the David story that demonstrates the way That love and kindness can change a person's life. We jump ahead in David's story to 2 Samuel 19, and it seems that everything that had been going well has fallen apart for David. We learn that there's been an attempt by David's oldest son to overthrow David's kingly rule. David's army has won the day. David had to flee the palace, but now in chapter 19, he's coming back. He's coming back to the palace. And upon returning, David finds Mephibosheth, waiting for him. This was a bit of a surprise to David because David had been told a lie that said that Mephibosheth was in on this uprising because Mephibosheth was upset that he didn't get more than what David had already given him. And David kind of believed that lie. After all, everybody else in David's life was now turning against him. Why wouldn't this man turn against him also? But here, David finds Mephibosheth not dressed in his best, looking like he's ready for a royal coronation to come back into town, but disheveled. We are told that his feet are uncared for, that his beard and mustache need to be trimmed. We are told that he's wearing dirty rags. In, in, in a sense, we're told that he hasn't done anything. It looks like he's done nothing for himself during the whole time that David has been away from the palace except worry about his friend. Mephibosheth's outlook on life had been changed because of the love that David had shown to Mephibosheth. That's what love does. Instead of hiding behind a crippled spirit and operating from from a poisoned outlook on life, Mephibosheth has become a friend to the one who showed God's love to him. 
David got to be the instrument of God's love to Jonathan's son. And that love changed a tragic figure into a living example of God's grace. So how does this Old Testament story affect us today as followers of Jesus? Remember the words that Jesus spoke in Matthew 22 to the man who asked, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus' answer to this man came from two Old, pa- two Old Testament passages that were put together. The first, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus says this is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. And here's the second quote. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. To say that another way, the hesed that God demonstrates to you is in return to be demonstrated to the people that God brings into your life. Last week's message said that God is at work in the lives of God's people, making us living examples of God's holy love. We hear that same message just with different words this morning. When we realize that we are called to love others unselfishly and in a way that helps them understand God. Before we can properly love others, we must surrender our lives to God. It is God's kingly love that made the difference in David's life, the life of Mephibosheth, the life of Mephibosheth and that makes the difference in our lives. Only by having God as king of our life can the practical actions of love shared with others be used by God to change a person's demeanor and outlook on life. This is the way God uses his people. As we are choosing to abide with God every day, God is doing the work of shaping us to be useful tools through which God's holy love can flow and is extended to everyone we encounter. God's love sees beyond what a person has been and reveals what a person has the potential to be in Christ. God's love has done the work of revealing and restoring in each of our lives who are choosing this morning to follow Jesus. And now God desires each of us to be examples of his love to everyone we meet. And with God's daily help, with his daily grace, we can be up to the challenge of loving others with the same kingly love that God is extending to us. This morning, friends, I hope, I pray, That as you heard this story from David's life, that the Holy Spirit touched something in your own mind, in your own spirit, and said, wow, if I were to stand before God, I would certainly fall on my face and think, oh, don't look too closely. I don't want you to see the things that I know are there. But God's grace and God's love is extended to you this morning so that instead of standing before God and, and fearing only judgment, that you can stand before God And hear the voice of the loving Savior speak your name in love and say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. The choice is up to you this morning as it is every day. Will you receive? Will you hear the voice of God calling your name? Will you receive the gift of God's love and grace? Will you extend that same love and grace to those who God puts in your path? The choice is yours. May your choice honor God. Let's sing our final hymn together this morning. Let's stand together. We'll sing, uh, Jesus, Lord, we look to thee. Jesus, Lord, we look to Thee. Let us in Thy name agree. Show Thyself the Prince of Peace. Bid our jarring conflicts cease. By Thy reconciled Spring.
spread thy banner here. Make us one of heart and mind, courteous, pitiful, and kind. Lowly, meek, in thought and word, all together like our Lord. Let us for each other care, each the other's burden bear. To thy church the pattern give, show spirits join each to each and all to thine free from anger and from pride let us thus in God abide all the depth of love express Let us pray. Father, this morning we have heard from the songs, from the scriptures, from the, from the prayers that have been prayed. We have heard you speak to us in so many different ways. You have taken full opportunity this morning, Lord God, for all who are here, whether in person, whether, whether online, to, to remind us that you continue to extend your chesed, your, your incredible, unimaginable grace and love to all. And Father, this morning we recognize that and I pray that we respond to your invitation to hear, to walk with you, to be, to live as your children, as your people in this world. Through us, Lord God, may your grace, may your love continue to be extended to those who are around us, that they might also come to know you as King of Kings as Lord of all, as loving Father. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity again this morning to hear this message. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity again to respond to this message and to choose your way over our own way. Go with this now, in Jesus' name, amen. And truly, may you go in the grace of God. May you take this message and, and live it, and in living it, May God's love and grace be extended to those who are around you. Go in peace.